Thank you. Everybody got really quiet. I think it's a really uh, great opportunity now to start catching some of what is bubbling up for people, um, the, the critical questions, the exciting bits. Um, this is a moment we have two things I'd hope we could do, and I wanted to explain a little bit of how we've been working today. Uh, Nance over there has been taking dictation, and I've been taking trying to catch patterns here on the wall. Um, and we're going to blend our notes and hopefully end up with a, a nice little summary of what got said for each project. I'd also like to come out with a little bit of a summary about what we think uh, today. The opportunities are what, uh, for, for example, um, a network, as well as for UTSC and what, what uh, they should take away um, uh, from, from today. So um, that's where I'm at uh, in terms of what I hope we can do. Uh, there, Beatrice mentioned that there's a possibility that we could just check in with you guys uh, around 5 to 2 to see uh, what you want to do in terms of the tour, whether the, the conversation's uh, going and we don't want to stop and we want to cut the tour a little bit short or whether you want to get moving. So we can, we can check in and, and uh, see where we're at then. So. <clears throat> They're going up to the rooftop garden. Yeah. Worms. We are going to see the, the, the rooftop um, are, are the worm friends. Um, yeah. And by that, I do mean worms, not the Yeah. Um, and, and the drop in. Yeah. Right. So, kitchen worms and rooftop garden, right? Um, very hard to compete with, <laughs> I will admit. Um, and nor do I want to compete. But I would like to um, hear from folks now about what, what issues you feel are the most critical for us to discuss under one of two topics, either what the network can be or what UTSC and or we have understood today. So top, top uh, things you want to name, what's been happening in the groups. And maybe I'll, I'll just jump in. I think it's important, and I, I just step over. I think it's important to make analytical distinctions and practical distinctions. Um, right. Yeah. Ah, I see. And then the camera can catch you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's important to make a, an analytical practical distinction between different models. So I think the Quantlin is a very different model than I think what maybe the intention is here, than what the intention is I know at least currently at Trent. So farmer training is a very different thing than an on-campus farm. And these two things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive at all, but I think they're very different projects. And I think it's worthwhile to, to keep that in mind. And as we're all at different stages of developing our farms, it's important to have a very clear image, I think, of sort of what the objective is, what the vision is. Um, Anyways, I just I just wanted to make that point because I let's let's take that a little sure, further because sure. I think it's yeah. a great way to go. So we have. I wanted to reply to that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll come to you. So we have the idea of that there are a bunch of different models. We've heard about the arc of time. So some projects are newer and some have been going much. UBC 100 years. Well, with lots of changes, but. Um, 90. 90. <laughs> Um, big budget, small budget, um, and different needs and, and, and goals around that. So maybe we could articulate a tiny bit around what the models are. Just very, I want to do this very briefly, though. Uh, shall we popcorn t speak them speak them into the room of the models that we saw? I just wanted to, if I can, yeah. just very quickly. I think that there's a couple of things that we mean by models here yeah. because, and I'm just sharing a little bit of the conversation we were having over there, but um, we're constantly being asked here, like, the financial model, mm. and and that I think was one of the things that, that Claire brought up that's so useful, is that we're talking models here. I think we should be talking about about both financial models and the and the pedagogical research, the the the. Uh, the the farming model that, that we're talking about here. I think this is a really useful exercise to do, partly because we do need the financial model to, to move forward, right? Yeah. Here and, and elsewhere, too. But I also think that the, the, the models that you're talking about, about like what we're actually delivering, is the kind of thing that we should actually, on some level, be start 
to populate a some kind of web page somewhere so that students, researchers, farmers know that there is this network that actually is communicating with each other that we can continue to populate to put up everything from budget models that might be a slightly more secure space, but images, recipes, research findings, those kinds of things, so that there actually is a, so that what you're doing now gets translated into, into something so that students know and can ultimately circulate throughout. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just gonna pull up my favorite, one of my favorite permaculture principles, <laughs> obtain a yield. We have to get something out of it or else why bother, right? And that, that means immediately, like that's why the farm started immediately, like two researchers got out there and did stuff because what's the point otherwise? So I think if there's low hanging fruit to use the metaphor of recipes and images, I was harvesting images today. Did anybody else do take any pictures? Yes. So <laughs> always I want to catch and store those things. So why don't you send your images to us? And we'll, we're, we've already started a, a Google document in which we're starting to build out the very beginnings of an external to the university system that can be merged later with the university system. Because having uh, edges in permaculture, we're, we're always thinking about what's happening in between an institution and everybody else, for example, the, the community engagement uh, as well. Yeah. It's a very chicken and egg thing, but I was very interested in especially in the recent case about the student integration center in the second story. So it's rather from the missing piece of the state, right? From your JSC. We have faculty, we have staff, we have administrators. We don't have students at the table. So I think that's a really key point we can learn from how the BC has been working with the students and putting them on board. And chicken and egg, they've got a shirt, they have those. To, but even at an area, we don't have the resources to manage it in the student interest we have outside of class. I can do it as an instructor, but if you have know, one person, the other person is working part time, working in the part time, but then that's the student interest of our manager. And believe you know, because I've seen students perform this market and so on, but they don't feel chicken and egg, and I'd love to know some of the strategies. And I think that's part of that work. <laughs> 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 So if we come back to, to for a second to models, if, would it be okay to just 30 you know, seconds from the key people? Yeah. Um, I was really struck when you were doing your little um, introduction at the farm of like, yeah, really different model, right? Just run with like a student nonprofit or student run kind of organization and then a separate kind of um, staff run and, and then partner together. So I think that's really interesting and very different than what we're doing, um, but really cool. Um, the other example, actually, I was thinking about before I came is the there's the Peace Farm in Montana, the University of Montana, and they got started by partnering with a local nonprofit organization, and um, so it was like a nonprofit organization and the university collaborating together to create the farm. So I think there's that. That's also an interesting kind of model. I don't know that much about it, but. Um, I don't know, Josh Slotnick apparently is, who's founded is apparently very open to um, talking about how that farm kind of got started. So I think that might be also someone too. Some people, you know, manager roles in the panel discussions. Yeah, this is Montana, Montana. Oh, sorry. Montana. Yeah, sorry. Peace Farm, Josh Slotnick, S-L-O-T-N-I-C-K. Anyway, just again, another model. Any other, so if we could summarize UBC, it's like a, a staff, it's a not-for-profit, nine staff. Um, hmm, what are we? I mean, uh, we're, we're under the umbrella of the university, so we're considered a charitable organization. Um, yeah. So donations so, are tax deductible, because that becomes very important. Yes, right? donations are tax deductible, yeah. Because we have a charitable number. Um, yeah, I guess that's how it is. I mean, it's it's not run by students anymore. It used to be run by students. A lot of university farms are still run by students. Um, I think the Montreal, the McGill farm is very much a student-run farm. I don't. I could be wrong about that. Um, so yeah, our model. I think the model has kind of morphed. You know, from 
in our current incarnation. Um, like it was started by students and then it morphed into this thing that's sort of been taken over by the university for better or for ill, you know. Um, but it's, yeah, it's got the staffing, faculty support, and charitable status, et cetera. So, yeah. Um, no, actually, yeah, that, yeah. But just listening to the presentation from UBC, there's so much that we share in common with UBC, um, from our financial model to our production numbers and revenue. So it's really neat to see that we're much smaller, but we're in the same sort of sphere. Um, but we're not in the academic side of the university. We're in the business side. So we are an ancillary service on campus in business services. So we're just like food services, parking, the bookstore, one card, um, conference services, we're in that group. So we're considered a service on campus. So we produce food for the campus community. And um, none of the businesses in business services really generate revenue. They're all subsidized by the university as a service to the community. And we, we, we raise, we, we sell $30,000 in food sales. And we've made, a, the most we've made in programming is 10. So the most, I mean, we came close to 50 one year. Yeah. So it was like just over 30 and just over 10, and we're a quarter acre. But obviously, we spend a lot more than that in staff. It'd be interesting to know the true cost accounting when you look at you know, the financials of, of that in, in all of the cases, because I know there's a lot of free service that gets ha that happens on many of these projects. Yeah, like in terms of what the university gives us? Yeah. Yeah, the university example. gives us a lot and then we give a lot back too in sure. that we um, we provide, you know, we we provide a lot of opportunities for students. We don't charge undergrads for the stuff that we give them. Um, we don't currently charge any researchers, but I think we will because we give them a lot of our time and um, the messaging around sustainability for the university. Mm -hmm. too. Sorry, I was just going to add the messaging around sustainability for the university too. Um, so there's like countless publications. The sustainability department references our operations very often. Um, so I think yeah, it's another hard to quantify kind of value. <laughs> same, we're the same. They use the UBC farm all the time. It's like oh look at those sustainability issues and on community engagement mm -hmm. and it's like oh our community and actually we're one of the main pieces of community engagement I would say for the UBC because yeah they don't do community engagement very well so yeah. <laughs> which um, undoubtedly translates into dollars from students coming into the university. Yeah. Like that, that's not um, an unreasonable thing to notice. Yeah. Um, well, and it was even went so far, like, and I don't want to belabor this point, but um, you know, there's this whole movement in Vancouver to get a uh, subway system all the way out to university, all the way out to the university. The province wants to stop it like 10 blocks before the university. And um, the university was, there was a referendum. So, okay, very similar. Um, but then there was a referendum in the city about extending the subway all the way to UBC. And UBC wanted to get community engaged, the community engaged, and therefore they would vote in favor of extending it all the way up to university, the university. And the farm was part of that. So part of that sort of communication piece about like how great the university is and everyone's going to want to come to the, all the way out to the end. So anyway, I, it's sort of a small thing, but it's also, it, it's a big thing for, at the university level. I you know, like of thinking of like, even though you think you're just a small piece of things, it's like, yeah, they're going to use you for, to get massive, mobilized massive amounts of provincial funding for infrastructure and stuff like that. So anyway. It's like a physical and social space where the community and the, and the university actually interact. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. one question for you guys prior to that follow that I would be, I'd be really curious if you guys have done like a like a web, web traffic um, in terms of Ryerson web traffic um, about what are the searches internally and externally on Ryerson. My guess is the rooftop garden is way up there in searches. Like here cool. they've done that. <laughs> they've done that. They've done that here and food studies is like 
the typically year in and year out is the second th highest traffic. We we should do that. Thank you for that tip. And share it with us because we would like to know. Sorry, I didn't want to lose the last point either. Like, what can we catch from each other? So, what can we start? What data can we start to track? So, I think the stories about mobilizing money, right? Like this kind of story is so interesting. Now, of course, it's hard to see. We have, we have to find the way to say these things. Um, but I think that if we have enough of these kinds of stories, those those are very helpful, right? Because it's true. Massive changes can happen from these kinds of projects, and so they, even if they lose money, or seem to lose money, they really they're not. They're a huge asset. Yeah. So you you were going to say something? Oh, I was just. Sarah Sarah Elton Sarah Elton was saying that the food studies course is like the most popularly taken course in the entire university. So, I just I know, I'm sure there is definitely truth. Thousand plus students. Another consideration for value is also the ecological services that the farm projects offer. And I think that's something that we haven't really uh, quantified yet, but hopefully as part of our living lab research, we'll figure out more ways, especially because we're like actively diverting stormwater, just being a green roof, let alone, um, yeah, like trying to figure out how, if we contribute to mitigating the urban heat island effect and how much, we know we do as a green roof, but like how much that sort of service too. And the, um, the professor, there was a professor who was instrumental in writing the bylaw for the city of Toronto, and that's a Ryerson professor, and it kind of grew out of the green roof that eventually became a farm. So I think it's important to remember that these things can change, can make big, big societal changes too. Maybe we'll see more rooftop farms mm -hmm. being used for the green roof bylaw because of Ryerson's urban farm. So then that ecosystem or that ecological service goes beyond just our own Local, yeah. Beatrice, do you want to describe the model of the Montreal? In Montreal? Uh, in Montreal, we, uh, we are a non-profit organization mm -hmm. mainly, mainly focused on research. Um, we have many projects, few on campus, because the new town in Montreal is very flat town, so a uh, very densified uh, um, organization uh, uh, around us. So we have uh, mainly the uh, Ashikan the Greenhouse, which is for seeding and research project. And then we have partnership with different organizations around Montreal, which uh, one of them is Palais de Congrès in Montreal. And we have um, access to the roof. So it's a 2,000 square meter, square meter roof. and uh, we have smart pets and um, a rural system to grow. So that's one of the projects that's been around for uh, since 2016. And um, we we don't I don't have the, the numbers for money and how much uh, uh, how the budget is um, is working. But for that project, we give a lot to the Palais de Congrès for the kitchen, and we give the rest through other organizations. So we don't make profit out of those uh, uh, projects. We, we mainly give uh, the product and we make the research so we have grants to um, to fit. And um, we have a business incubator too. One of them is a wine yard uh, on top of the Palais de Congrès and other locations on ground level two since 2016. So that's really a business model. She's working uh, uh, to grow her business uh, out of it to really have urban wine yard in a, a very densified um, location. And uh, we, we started in 2019 with other organizations what we call Sankal Agricole, it's an um, industrial building and we have a 1,900 square meter inside the building. So there's eight small companies that share the space and uh, the, the goal is to have a circular economy. So some of them are growing insects, taking the, uh, the products, the, the um, 
organic matter from other companies and having a, a circular economy in, inside that building, inside that uh, um, that location, and that's a business incubator too. And that since this year, so it's just started. I cannot tell you what are the challenges yet. And we have the roof too, access to the roof, so there's a farm a growing uh, territory. So that's um we oh sorry, you don't know a lot about McGill. I think it's one uh, it's talked about Kuna is more mainly uh, working out of McGill. But yes, yeah, they might have a student tech project too, but I don't know that. That's it. I'm open for questions, but on budget I cannot tell you that. And if you don't, if you don't type in the microphone, I can't. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just put on the the microphone because I realized that it, it, in terms of model, can we just get down what staffing levels are and 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 if if possible, like where where does those staffing and we we could talk at another time about what the academic staffing is, but if we could just get down, if only for our admin, but for I think for all of us. Um, of what are the staffing levels of, and almost sort of per yield, per acreage, if that's, if that's useful. I think per role is important too, because I think division of roles helps a lot. Yeah. Beautiful. And that, that may be a document that we could share, those org charts that you talked about. That might be, you know, a level of specificity that, that would be useful just to look at, but just in general, if we can, if we can get that down. So at, at UBC, you have a farm manager and 30 student staff, <coughs> 30 to 35. And do you have any anyone in between yeah. those? Um, yeah, we have a lot of people in between. So I have an org chart, but I've scribbled all over it, so I don't really want to show. But there's, and so That's a whole this is, yeah, um, this is me. These are all the people who are directly under me. <laughs> and then there's a whole bunch of students and stuff under that. So I have about, I have a, so there's, so there's the academic director and the operations director. And we're sort of at the same level, although I, yeah, I report to her, but we work very closely together. And then, yeah, I've got about eight or nine people who are directly under me. And those are the ones who are the year round ones that I was sort of describing um, full time year round. And then about 35 students uh, doing all sorts of different things, sales, children's programs, um, uh, working in the field, that kind of thing. Yeah, and they're the seasonal ones. So people do a mix of farm work and other work. It's not sort of separate, the programming and the farming there. Uh, no, it's pretty separated. Yeah, like we've got our children's programs. The people who work in the children's programs don't do field work. People who work in sales don't do field work. Um, but there is some, there are some positions that cross over. Like our volunteer coordinator is also one of the, she manages one of the major fields um, because she, a lot of the volunteers end up helping her in her field, but also because she's very knowledgeable and can share information with the volunteers. So there are, there are a few roles that are combined. Um, our Saturday market coordinator also does field work. Um, yeah, so there are a few. And I, yeah, I could share this org chart. Um, one thing actually I'm really interested in is getting away from this very hierarchical, uh, I hate this, and I've looked at other models online with different bubbles and different things, Venn diagrams, and I'm just, if anyone comes across a really interesting or useful model, like org chart, I would actually love to see that and play around with that. So anyway, just putting that out there. Um, yeah. Sorry, related to that. Oh, um, how would that in practice work out, like especially with funding decisions being made if you had a flatter or a different, less hierarchical model? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to get, you know, I'm, I would like to get to a place where we're making more sort of grassroots community-based sort of modeling decision-making that's a sort of flatter model. Mm -hmm recognizing and working within a very hierarchical institutional mm -hmm. structure. Well, it's like, okay, how do we do that? Um, I mean, budget-wise, um, 
Do you have some of that now where, you're, you know, there's yes. autonomy or there's... Yeah, we have some old... Yeah, quite a few of the roles okay. have a lot of autonomy. Um, I mean, ultimately, I make, I'm the one who has to make a final decision mm -hmm. on things if there's something that needs to have a final decision. But um, yeah, a lot of these people sort of right underneath me have autonomy to make their own decisions. They manage their own budgets. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, maybe that's asking. what you were trying yes. to get to. So there's this big overall farm budget, and then it's broken out into different programs. And each of these people manage their own budget. Okay, that's yeah. great. Yeah, and then at the end of the year, well, we touch base throughout <laughs> the year. <laughs> and then at the end of the year, it's like it all comes together. And a report like, okay. together. Yes, exactly. Great. Yeah. I've spoken so much. I've said too much. <laughs> I mean, I was just going to, like, off the top of my head say that you know, I, I'm the farm manager, so I do less farming than I used to, but I started out doing mostly farming. And I think a lot of people in the university, it's hard to imagine how much work farming is. It really is so much work to grow things from seed to harvest and then to harvest them and distribute them before they, because they're perishable. And it's just, when you've invested so much, sometimes you're like, oh, well, I'm just gonna work till dark and then come back at sunrise because I've already put in months of time into this one thing, or, or you really want things to be perfect to prove that it's po this is possible. Look how great it is. <laughs> so I think it's just important to remember that there's just so, like the research is so important, and the community engagement and all that stuff, but just that the farming itself is a ton of work. Yeah, and it, it takes paid staff and coordinators. Being able to delegate to volunteers takes paid staff. So I guess that would be my main thing, yeah. Um, so just in regards to developing the network, uh, one point that I've been wanting to bring up um, is the, the possibility for, for advocacy um, with regards to what we're discussing. So salary seems to be a large component of any of these farm operations. Um, and in our case at Trent, it's the reason why we're not sustainable um, and it sounded like it's the reason why KPU isn't sustainable um, and so I think it's it's interesting and it might be uh, a network topic for as Dan said to collect our structures of uh, what are our salaried positions how does that look um, from from our cost perspective and then um, look at advocating for things like there's uh, it's called the scientific research and experimental development um, program which is a tax incentive so it's a federal tax incentive that currently um, from, as i understand it uh, tech firms are using this to write off their costs for engineering so what's the name again it's the s r and e d uh, program so scientific research and experimental development program um, so things like this where clearly the government is valuing this kind of work um, the the engineering work that's completed in a tech firm um, we're obviously bringing a lot of value uh, to institutions um, to to our communities and and ultimately to, to the government. Um, so how can we advocate, um, and this is the network piece, together um, to start to present and, and paint this picture more clearly um, and, get, and get this agenda um, at that, that level, that higher level, um, you know, where we can start to leverage uh, the support that we, you know, as, as farmers, as researchers, as faculty, um, community members are we're doing this work and we're realizing that it's um, you know it's it's not being compensated um, and it's not being realized and um, so that's that's just one idea um, for the network side this is another new kid on the block kind of question since that's what we are um, but you put Matthew I'm sort of pushing you on this but you you put unsustainable in in quotation marks and I, I know that that's partly because 
you're very sustainable in terms of what you're actually producing, but that's not really the point that I think you're making. When is that, that those quotes are, is that, is that a discourse that's emerging within the university itself? Like, oh my God, this, this garden has become a problem because it's losing money? Or like, is there an expectation in different places of that it is a self-sustaining, self-funding initiative? Or are there models out there where this is seen as something that, that does the, the work of ecological visibility, um, that it does the work of drawing in a range of different you know, donations. Let's face it, no American football program is also sustainable by the same model, but nobody sees it as unsustainable, right? Um, or is it seen as, um, like in, in different ways, in what places is it seen as it must pay for itself? And in, in what kind of models are out there where it's seen as an investment in other areas and so it, it's, it's not calculated as a loser or, or winner uh, in terms of, of money? D does that make sense? I'm trying to formulate a question of, uh, again to get at this because this is the question that's being raised about for us is where is the money going to come from for the farm? Is it going to be a grant thing? Is it student dollars? Is it selling the food? Those kinds of things. I can That's speak, the background. I can speak to that from Ryerson's perspective. Initially, Ryerson thought that we would be financially sustainable. So we had this little plan. They were going to. Would, gonna, would, not. would yeah. The, we had a little plan that we were going to become less dependent on them every year. But in fact, we've doubled our amount of money every year that we get from them. And uh, when, we were, when we moved into business services, that was when my boss said, <laughs> why do you need to be financially sustainable when none of the other ancillary services are? Food services doesn't make a profit. It's, it goes into debt every year, and neither does conference services or the bookstore or the one card. The only one that makes money is parking, which pays for all the other ancillary services. But, but to the point of the football thing, she was just like, well, why, why should the urban farm have to make money? It has so much value outside of money, and one of the things is experiential learning, right? Which is a huge mandate of the university. So, and I think that maybe because of Ryerson was really into the startup culture when the Ryerson Urban Farm began, and they were sort of like real education for the real world, this idea that you'd make your own way in the world. So we had all these zones, and so I think they thought it was going to be something like that, but there isn't, I think a lot of people think that rooftop farming and urban agriculture is going to be um, scalable, it, like Uber. But it's not. There isn't like a big profit to be made in 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 food. <laughs> yeah, good point. In, in Uber, in Uber yeah. either. But I also wanted to say to my other point of how much work farming is that I think that that's the importance of the division of roles as well, because the administrative work is also so important, and it's not possible for someone to do both. I don't think. Like when you're really focused on making sure the garden grows, and you're also trying to take in all these emails and to collaborate with different groups across campus and incorporate researchers, that's when I think stuff starts to fall through the cracks. So I think it's important to have a research coordinator and an administrative person who's the front-facing person and blah, blah, blah. I wondered if uh, maybe the, the, uh, Oh, sorry. But also, we, we had a line of, hold on, Joe. Oh, OK. We, we just had, had. <laughs> um, I just. Uh, I don't wish to speak for Guelph, but I do know a little bit of what they would say if they were here. Um, something to speak to the advocacy part of, of creating a network is um, just that the Guelph farm is at risk of development, like major serious risk of being just paved over for the new Honeybee Research Center at the University of Guelph. And so they are looking for serious support, um, both like within the campus and then with this budding network, um, yeah, just to touch on the advocacy role. But I want them to speak to that themselves as well. But yeah, I really wish someone could have been here, and I'm sure they would have a lot to say. Thank you. Joe, I just wanted to actually ask, in the example of the UTS business I brought in the office with us, I thought that was a really important point coming from our accents and so talking about models. But I don't want to not, because I don't know. So I think to be 
Yeah, most of our, sorry, most. In business development, we do typically run a, like a baseline, like we don't run deficits. So yeah, that's all I can say is that we, we try to, you know, as ancillary services. It was actually interesting to hear, it was news to me that. Medium sharing secrets. <laughs> I know, I know. Your, your director may be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what are you doing? Um, and I may not be privy to that information as well, but I do know that people we, were fired before my director yeah. was hired, so I think maybe there was some scandal. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know. But as an ancillary <laughs> service, right, there is the importance of like showing that you do have revenue and that you do have expenses and balancing them out as a business model, right? So, yeah, it is important to know where your money's coming from and how you're expect I'd how love you're to see it. the farm like for the to be supported through the places that make the most sense for the provost to pay for some of the experiential learning that we do and for university advancement to pay for some of the more like the greenhouse that we build or whatever it is and then to have the farm operations be paid for by business services and our own revenue mm -hmm. so that would that would be ni a nice goal moving forward to try to tease out you know, so that business services isn't necessarily paying for experiential learning if right. that doesn't make sense, right? right? Yeah. But also that there is professors aren't going to pay for, for farm operations for us to just grow and sell food, so. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I'm, I'm noticing an interesting pattern as I'm processing here, which is UBC sort of some students hop the fence. Is that or where, was that you? Yeah. yeah. So that was like a bottom up kind of development, which then turned into a top down yes. hitting into this, right? And then um, Guelph, I don't know Guelph's situation. Uh, Guelph was also bottom up. Bottom up. But I mean, also Guelph has this super rich agricultural college history that, you know, yes. the other side of Guelph, like outside of the Organic Center for Agriculture at Guelph, is quite top down and is massively funded. There's so. already a massive interesting pressure oh, yeah. going on. And there's dichotomies there, of yeah. course. It's very intricate. Yeah. So anyway, I'm just what I'm thinking about is it's it's fairly rare to do a very well done holistic process from a top down position. I know this. I've seen them. I've been parts of them before, but it's it's very complex and it takes quite a long time. And I'm thinking you've kind of gotten it to the point where things are working at UBC. It's taken about 20 years, right? And I think, I think it's probably worth saying here that it will take quite a long time. And it's kind of a bit scary to say that up front. But I think it's worth being honest that it is a, a very big undertaking. And so if we do it right here, it can maybe set the stage for things being done less bottom up everywhere else because it's very hard to do things bottom up. It's extremely, it's really taxing on the individuals. So in terms of equity and, and fairness and doing things well. So I, I guess one question I've been sitting with is how does, what does this process look like for the university moving forward? And a creative thought I had with Kim on the side was just the idea of having a budget conversation. And sitting down and saying, okay, let's have a creative budgeting conversation where we imagine throwing in all the budget lines that we think would actually be of value and of service here to, to which of course begs the question of what are we trying to do? <laughs> what is, you know, is it gonna be focused on research? Is it focused on teaching? Is it focused on production? Is it focused on community engagement? Um, so, but one could separate out some of those goals. So, you know, sort of have sections around those things and, and essentially lay out what, what the, Kajillion dollar budget would look like for those things, and then phase it in over time. So you could just take pieces of it and, and start building up pieces of it and doing doing the community engagement for for example correctly, you know, fully, or in the, engaging the the uh, courses, all the courses that need to be included at the first round, properly, right? So um, it's like one one idea of how, what kind of a conversation we could get past the. These are big, there's a lot floating, right? So how do we ground this into a next conversation that goes into the university um, rooms and brings some resources? Um, I also think it, an, important, an important part of that exercise, and I don't know how compelling an argument this is necessarily to administrators, but 
I think some of us appreciate the limits of sort of neoclassical economics and um, uh, um, there is a value proposition as well to each discrete item that you so so for for each budget item there's a value proposition yeah. part of the work of what a network could potentially do um, is to help to, to, to do to do the analysis what what value are we getting for each budget for you know for each line item because um, I think that Intuitively and anecdotally, it seems like yes, there's a value here. I mean, we know there is. You know, I've taken students to our farm, and um, Emma's worked with hundreds, thousands of, of volunteer students. Um, we can see the change. It's incumbent upon us, probably, um, as a network or whatever you know we want to call this at the moment, um, to put that in terms that can be appealing to administrators. I think. That's right. Um, um, and I'll just I'll just note before I forget to as well. One of the things that Trent has, um, and this is by way of res offering resources, I guess, to this sort of fledgling network, is we have a very uh, flexible course structure. So we can, we can frame a course up around literally anything. So um, I, this is off the record. I keep, I keep, I keep saying that, um, you know, I, I keep telling students, let's try to pitch something that they'll say no to, and I haven't heard no yet. So. Um, so we could frame up a course, we could have a student starting in January potentially to, to maybe do some work to help support the development of a network, whether that would be collecting models to put on a website somewhere to do some research into, yeah, how do we sort of capture the economics of the value? I mean, it could be anything. Anyways, I put that out there again just by way of identifying an immediate resource that uh, I think could be could be mobilized as, as, as early as January. Michael, well, I'm actually looking for a course in January. <laughs> and there we, go. we are yeah. we're already doing something together, yeah. but I'm just wondering like the timeline of this, like how much is possible in a four month semester long course? It does feel like a quite extensive, you know, project. I mean, obviously a proposal could be made, but yeah. It sounds like there's something really exciting emerging here, like between universities. Like we just met with Eric Duchemin last week, and um, you know he's working to help to accumulate some of this information, and he already has um, a lot of information from different universities and um, rooftop farms and urban agriculture farms in Quebec. Um, so. You know, so you wouldn't have to start from scratch, and there's different people that you could connect with. And just in this meeting alone, there's been a lot of different figures that have been thrown out and um, collected somewhere. You know, so um, and um, yeah, he he like uh, between UCAM and uh, Ryerson University, they're making an MOU. I, mean, I don't really know what that you know. Maybe you guys understand better what that means, but um, an agreement between universities to like officially collaborate um, and that seems like something that's kind of just naturally emerging between the different universities that have urban agriculture um, going on. And so um, it's definitely a conversation that we're gonna be pursuing and um, we're, we're gonna be hosting a round table event um, this winter as well where we can keep having these conversations and um, because the network just really seems to be um, emerging very organically. <laughs> so I would point out just for our very yellow thing up there. That, um, Do you understand our network? <laughs> that uh, under, under network, that um, with the, the new Canada food strategy, um, for all its limitations, does open up um, some possibilities, um, financial or otherwise, and I don't, I don't want to focus on that that much, but that's, that is the, the administrative part of my my world, um, but um, that does open up some real possibilities. And one of the things that that strategy does call for is, is certain kinds of educational things. And so if we are ahead of that game, that will help in terms of being able to facilitate things like that, that have come up in the discussion thus far, student exchanges. Um, Ultimately, some kind of, and Marnie was talking about this, so I'm just repeating what she said in private, but to, in the public, is, is potential things like coursework, where students really are rotating through, through different kinds of programs. Uh, let's see, other things that have come up about um, 
Oh, I can't remember, but that, that's sort of enough for, for now. But. So funding based on the new... I, I think there's, I think there's, there's, you know, the possibility of funding. Some of that, of course, will depend on what happens in October um, and how seriously a new government, what it looks like, takes that, that Canada food strategy. But it certainly raises the profile and connects us directly to other kinds of things like Food Secure Canada, like the new Canadian uh, Food Policy Council, um, and um, you know some other kinds of, of access things there to other kinds of ministries as well. I don't know if it's come up yet, but I think that <clears throat> urban agriculture on campuses is a really special thing. And um, this might be subjective, but I think that urban agriculture th projects thrive on campuses. And um, I think that's partly because campuses have a lot of space and, and non-monetary resources um, and excitement and student energy and faculty and food energy insecurity. and food insecurity, yeah. But I think that they also thrive because there are resources on campus and I think it's important for universities to invest in in the urban agriculture projects. Um, because I think that we are, you know, what happens at the universities can be shared outside of the university where other projects that are outside of the university don't have access to those same resources. So in the urban agricultural landscape, I think universities have more resources than, than most urban agriculture pro projects and that's why they thrive on campuses. I'm uh, thinking about sort of how, what we might take, we're gonna think of what all that's been said today. There's, there's um, probably some fairly simple low hanging fruit we can do, right? Like stuff that people, in, individuals here can just do certain things. And then there's probably some medium sized things or even one medium sized thing. Like if we were to imagine in one year, what will we have done as either as a network or as, you know, like how can we do one thing within a year? And I, I say that because I know how these things go and it can be you know, this amazing conversation and then you know, yeah. nothing happens. Or, or it's confusing, frankly, that there's so many pieces to, to think about and we'll all take away slightly different perspective on what the most important thing was or be overwhelmed or whatever it is, right? So could we do a little bit of a list about immediate short-term things that each of you can imagine doing and then maybe have a, a brief discussion about one or two bigger ideas that we could focus a little bit. Does that seem a reasonable thing to try to do? Yeah. Well, one of, one of the little things that could contribute to a medium-sized thing could be the, like, deciding if there's some key kind of metrics what that we may all already have, and then sh sharing those things um, across, you know, at, on some platform. If it's the development of um, a website or um, something. Um, so the small task is for somebody to work, do a first draft of a metrics spreadsheet, right, and then pass it to the next person to, to <laughs> give some feedback. Like you see where. I'm, so is there somebody that? likes to build spreadsheets? Or, <laughs> or I don't know if it needs to be someone who builds it and then shares it versus just, you know, if it's just how many paid like full-time employees, how many, like if it's just basic kind of numbers that just need to be collected and then mm -hmm. shared. And then if the medium-sized thing is for someone to like compile that data. So it's however it is, whether, we're talking about building a survey or building, just figuring out what the questions are and asking them. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, and I guess if Eric Duchesne already has a framework of line items of data that he's collecting for Quebec, it might be interesting to start there. So yeah, yeah you could just take what he's been doing and add into it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, on that point, there is also, I mean, another maybe long-term uh, way to build up a network. I know that, yeah, Eric Duchemin has been doing like a summer school and mainly in Montreal, and he's been also connecting with Europe to, to host those summer school. And uh, yeah, he's, he, I mean, he's interested to actually kind of pass on 
uh, to someone else to actually do those summer schools. So that's maybe also one way how we could build up a stronger network is like, you know, having each of us like hosting this kind of scum, summer school. That would be, I mean, the model that has been using, I think, is like one week long where you do have, I mean, many practitioner things, not necessarily just academic focus, but it's really practitioner, a series of workshops, so then with different theme depending on the interest at the time, but also doing like tools of, you know, other sites, so then everyone can really learn from each other. And so I think that would be also one way, and I've, I've been thinking to maybe do that maybe not this summer, not the 2020, but maybe 2021, probably in partner with, I mean, Joan Asher and like Ryerson, this could be something where we could look at and then, you know, kind of bring that across the, I would say the Anglophone world because so far it's really being the Francophone that's been doing this. So I think that would be one way we can make that stronger. I'm sorry, that on medium. Medium, <laughs> long term, yeah, two years. Beatrice, you can't hear, right? Who are the participants in the summer school? Uh, I mean, Beatrice, Beatrice, I don't know if you can talk more about the summer school exactly who's been part uh, partnering with there or participating. I know that uh, for summer school, it's been 10 years. Yeah. And um, we roughly had between 100 and 200 participants every year. And it was uh, this year was mainly on um, education. So, uh, uh, sorry, I'm looking for the word. I have it in French. Jean de pédagogique. So if somebody can translate it, sorry. For some words, it doesn't come up uh, right away. And then we had less participants. And the other years, we had uh, one uh, thematic on uh, urban planning, another one on uh, school garden, another one. So we had many uh, themes that people could uh, subscribe for one or another, and this year was only on the uh, school gardens, so we had a little bit less people coming, but the, the other years were about 200 people, and I think Eric wants to pass on to other university, but I can talk to for him, I, I, I'm not sure about it, and I want to have on uh, the spreadsheet, or collecting data, and in Bordeaux this uh, summer, we uh, linked with other uh, research program university in France and in Europe. And uh, we were working on trying to collect business model data for farms and trying to work something we can all have the same data and share it. So I'm sure we would be open to collaborate for that. But I can talk to Eric. Uh, sure. I, I'm pretty sure it will be there. It sounds like a very, um, that the summary is review that list and and co collaborate on, on figuring out, getting it out to other people in Canada, whether it's just this group to start or whether we just, us and our friends or whatever it is. Yeah. I like, that's a nice low, hand, like an easier one to, to, we can move on with summer school being our bigger project. <laughs> And Sorry, website. Can you it started in my mind about four <laughs> hours ago, yeah. <laughs> I actually just asked Nancy Olivia to send around everyone's email addresses for the start. So. For sure, that will happen. So we can share. I, and I'm going to propose we, we do that in a spreadsheet form so, so that we can. Yeah, I do have it, all the emails because I've been sending the agenda as well. So, and I can even add people from Guelph that couldn't make it. And I know actually, I just remember also there was someone from Durham College that I just met last week and he couldn't make it today. But yeah, I think he's really interested to also be partner in the future. So I can also add him as well. Um, another thing that could be done in the immediate term is, um, um, I mean, I'm happy to write up a script if, if there's an appetite to, to engage a student to do some of this, even collecting them based on, based on data, maybe a couple other activities that we could identify that are scope appropriate for like a four month, fourth year student to, to do. Um, it requires essentially just writing a paragraph of the kinds of things that they would do very briefly. Um, I, could, I can commit to doing that and circulating it to those who would want to see it for input so that we can sort of collaboratively de develop what kind of tasks the student might do in the, in the context of this course. Um, I think that's a pretty immediate term. As again, as long as there's an appetite, it would be worth a worthwhile endeavor. Great.
Yes, I'd be hungry for that. <laughs> um, to pull on your, your image. So one thing that I might challenge you to do with some of that is to is not just be collecting data, but visual material too, mm -hmm. because that's part of what's going to appeal to a number of different stakeholders, to, to possible students who want to learn these things, to researchers moving into these areas, to grassroots groups within various part of other universities that would like to tear up those grassroots and put in food crops, um, and to university administrators who want to see these kinds of things. So what I would in encourage somebody, perhaps in coordination with a student, is to, is to put together a kind of almost visual, very yeah. accessible, you know, what is the shape of urban agriculture in Canadian universities? What are the lessons that are out there for those who are interested? What does it look like? What do campus farms look like? And I would to give you the place to send it. I'm one of the editors of Gastronomica. We have a very big circulation. Um, yeah. in, academically, we are we are printed full color, and we would be very interested in publishing that. And I suspect that I could also ask the press if we publish something like that, that we could make that free on our website, probably, um, for for use for for different groups to see what's out there to bring attention to whatever network we have, but also to provide a primer so that other universities are, are moving into this area. So we, we if you're should. interested in taking yeah. this into this kind of area of publication, we could do that. Uh, we need a donate button. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that too. I'm happy with that. But in the meantime, we can just get it in publication. Yeah. <laughs> was, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's great, but um, I was, I was going to mention, I'm on the, the Canadian Food Studies editorial collective, so I thought we pu we published it there, but you yeah. know, we can decide that later on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I feel like some master's theses have already been written about some of, you know, like, yeah. I, like I know several students who did surveys of, you, you know, um, Canadian university campus farms, so maybe the first thing that student yeah. would do would be to do a survey of right. existing yeah. <laughs> publications. Yeah. 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 I think I heard that there's also um, some sort of campus agriculture network in the States um, that seems to be gaining ground. So I wonder if that's something to look to as well um, for Canada. I know that there's been, I think, some interest from, I don't know, Joe Nasser or someone at Ryerson had mentioned that a while ago. But it certainly does seem like it would be useful, even if it's not like, I don't know how active a network it would need to be, but it sounds like even if the first stage was just kind of having, um, like, hosting the information of, like, an organizational structure and, like, um, maybe the kind of priorities are, like, a one-pager of each project. So you can kind of, like, compare apples to apples a little bit more in terms of what the different firms are looking like. That would be very useful, I think, just for quick reference. Um, also, one more sort of medium-term project so a piece of existing sort of social infrastructure is um, the CAFs um, annual meeting which is in London I think this year at Western um, so potentially there's an appetite to Get I mean the appetites. <laughs> yeah, I, <get> the appetite. <laughs> um, I mean you know depending on maybe on what our capacity is and and um, it, I mean, this could involve just saying, yeah, some of us will be at the CAFs meeting anyway. Let's meet up. Let's have a sort of a little sub-meeting while we're there to let's apply for a connections grant to actually curate, you know, a day-long meeting after CAFs or before CAFs to let's submit some, you know, a couple panel proposals or a workshop proposal, um, to, you know, to present some of the stuff that we're talking about here. I think there's lots of opportunities associated with, with this summer's CAFs meeting is, is the point. Uh, uh, CAFS is the Canadian Association of Food Studies annual meeting, um, which is held uh, as part of the Congress, um, and it's uh, yeah it's in it's out Western this year. It's usually May, May, June, May, Whenever late May, early June. Well, maybe we'll register. Now is that is we it June? Yeah. To look forward to. <laughs> I guess I had just one sort of observation, like a, we find ourselves, I think, um, with ties into many different communities being like a campus greener, so like into ecological farmers, 
networks and into green infrastructure networks into some food security stuff here and there. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting to think, I guess, in terms of scope of what this sort of resources look like is, I guess, just what capacity and what sort of, yeah, activity level of a network people are looking for and have resources to participate in. And uh, yeah, if it's like this sort of a meeting, obviously this has like the agenda of like UTSC. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of a thought The yeah, all, that was all. <laughs> I, think, I think it's also probably worth saying that um, starting a new network or starting new organizations is often what in our, it's what we do because it's what has always been done. And I'm always interested in thinking about how one can align with what's already happening. Yes. And, and so taking the energy that it takes to build a network and a website and all of those things and sort of essentially be really minimalist about that yes. so that everybody's resources are available for the projects already doing so much on. So, so it could be a, an interesting design conversation around what does it look like to do what we're doing, but just harvest better <laughs> well, what we're doing. In that case, I guess I wasn't going to bring it up, but I guess I will. Meal exchange? Should I not have said that? Does anyone work with meal exchange? Trent did. Trent did? Is it useful at all? Because sometimes these, like, they are a network that's supposed to bridge campus urban agriculture groups oh, yeah, across yeah. Canada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're kind of and controversial, though. Yeah. 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 We, we haven't really, they haven't managed to really help us to date. I, I don't know why it just hasn't worked. So I don't, sometimes I don't know why those support groups don't work. But Trent had a, a relationship with Meal Exchange for years, and I think it kind of dissolved and was full of conflict. So it, it yeah, wasn't helpful in my experience when I was working with them, um, but maybe they've changed. <laughs> it's, we, don't, we don't have a lot of time, so they just ask to meet a lot, and I'm like, sorry, I'm busy. Mm -hmm. And then they, they ask for our stats at the end of the year so they can put it in their annual report. Right. That seems to be the relationship today, but. Yeah. I just want to put something forward, and I think I might be really far into the future, but I wonder if the idea of maybe building a co-op of campus farm, I know that that's been happening around University for Food Services, that they've kind of did this co-op where they can actually negotiate, I mean, it was mainly to negotiate, you know, prices on food, and so, so I wonder if as, you know, campus farm having needs to buy, you know, materials, that also could be one way we can actually kind of threaten a network and already showing that, yeah, we want to be economically sustainable, let's say, but we also have a business in mind that, you know, we want to negotiate good prices for our stuff. So, I don't know. Uh, I mean, to the co-op idea anyway. So that's why I just want to see if that could something that could work in the future. Mm -hmm. So you, you're saying the campus farms would create a co-op? Well, so we would yeah, be the members be, or the... Yeah, it could be like every campus farm could be a member of a co-op. Mm -hmm. So at least we, and we could start to be, and, that, and I guess when you develop the co-op model, you really need to think about this, but you know, members could start to be as uh, buyers. So we would you know, be, help, be able to kind of negotiate to ever, you know, supplier prices because, you know, we'll say, well, you know, with those five, 10, 20 campus farm around mm -hmm. that we want to buy, you know, salt from you, or we want to buy, you know, kind of really specific equipment, seeds, stuff like this, that, you know, we could probably have preferential prices, but also then we could also see it as a way yeah, to network and then maybe facilitate exchange of students and resources. I don't know, it's just something to think about how that could be. And maybe yeah, see that we're not just a network on our own, but we're part of a more you know, cooperative or like a yeah, network. I like that idea because I think we differ from regular farms in that we do a lot more education and research. So then we could also share research through that network and we could share our standard operating procedures or our workshop mod, like, yeah. you know. Or insurance. Yeah, because is anyone farm registered? Our insurance person for Ryerson University just emailed us and asked us what our farm number is, and I was like, uh oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> you do? No, we don't. Okay. Well, I'm going to call them and find out if we need one, and I'll let the group know. Exactly. I mean, actually, that's been a question. I mean, that's been a question that we that was raised here at UTSC. Is like, can we actually call us a farm? 
because yeah, we're not registered. And then there's also this idea of like around, I mean, for the community, yeah, I mean, how do we there interpret a farm? I mean, we don't have any cows, we don't have any pigs, but still there is this connotation with farm. So yeah, but that was something that we came up is like, are we just a large community garden, or garden, or are we really a farm? So that might be something we need to figure out. And I guess, I don't know if anyone's mentioned like union relations, but that's just thinking about co-ops. I feel like our, we've developed, like we're so d deeply entrenched in the university services at this point that, um, yeah, it's just an interesting thing to consider. Like we do have, like we're, we're unionized staff yeah. and um, yeah, just considering how, I don't know how different unions work across campuses or if maybe some of them are the same, um, but yeah, just something to consider too. Um, speaking of unions, um, the National Farmers <coughs> Union, like there was some interest because on-campus farms like have a very unique position in like th that they don't fit into the NFU in any way right now. But the NFU had some interest um, in my relations with them to potentially increase their kind of mandate to include campus farms as being like a whole separate entity of Canadian agriculture. So this network would fit very snugly into the NFU in that way. It's a great idea. I think, yeah. It's a great and idea. I, I have a lot of connections with the NFU Ontario. I don't know if other folks have connections with NFU like across Canada, but um, yeah, they have a wonderful youth summit um, for young farmers and they have their 50th anniversary conference this November in Winnipeg. And anyways, they have all sorts of like similar sort of networking possibilities. A couple of things, Claire, you were asking about um, alternate models of organizing and one of the groups I'm working in is starting to take on sociocracy. Um, so working in moving toward, I mean, we don't have even one full-time equivalent, but we have do a lot of work in the community, a remarkable amount of work. And so and we've been designing this for seven years, top-down design, um, engaging about 60 people. And it's been very interesting to sort of play out how to, how to um, coordinate and organize ourselves so that we have a decentralized system that's light, that's not dragging on any of us too much, mm -hmm. where we're joyful to work, where we're not killing ourselves, <laughs> we're getting a lot of work done. And it's, there's, there's, it's extremely challenging. I think it's a design um, challenge of this, of this moment in time mm -hmm. and of this kind of group. Um, and that's why I asked that question of how can we not form a network? <laughs> mm -hmm. how, can we, how can we form something that you know, works with, say, there's all these organizations out there like the NFU or whatever, all these organizations that have like two people provincially, right? Or whatever right. they're doing. And it's extremely, they're working so hard and so if we brought a little bit of our group's energies into each of the organizations and then had a, um, a, an elegant way of communicating, like a socio, socio, I'm not saying that that's the answer yet, I'm still researching this, about a year of researching, but having a model in which, in, in this model, it's uh, two people are in the main, there would be a main governance circle, like say it would be like this, a meeting once a year somewhere at one of the conferences perhaps, and then the circles would go out and they would work on things like Summer Institute or mapping projects or surveying or building resources and making them available to share. So people take on specific mandates, they work, they work on them, and then they come back and report in once a year and, and run as efficiently financially as they can. If they need funding, they, you know, there's ways that people work together to, to bring in money. But it's, pretty, it's been pretty interesting watching and I've been, as I've been researching sociocracy hearing about the impacts that some of these groups have been able to have has been quite remarkable, you know, cha like changing the course of uh, elections, for example, like fairly major things because they're working in alternate models. Yeah. Um, so. Sociocracy? Sociocracy. I'll, I can share the folder with you of, of the research. Um, and in terms of mapping, I also, uh, I'll share also with the group. Um, I've been working uh, on, uh, last year I started a map called a, it's a permaculture map of projects. But um, the survey we did was not about permaculture, it was called regenerative community, it's a com regenerative community research project. And we ended up with 55 projects on a map. And I showed it to Eric uh, Duchemin, 
um, we had a nice conversation about it. So I'd really like to be in, the, in on that conversation about what does the survey look like. And each project has a page and it links to their web and it can be updated once every year or two. Pretty simple. It was a template, a process to explore what it looks like, again, with the same question of how do we not form a network? How can we? <laughs> it's a theme <laughs> for me, but how do we do this, right? How do we express this, that stuff is happening without having to institutionalize or weight it down? Can I? What's that? Hi. Well, yeah. what, like one thing I was thinking about was the new national, what's it going to be called, the Canadian Food Policy Council. Like, I wonder if we could be like sort of a working group within that council or something. Like, I'm not sure what their mandate is going to end up being, but rather than create a brand new network, it's like maybe we could help them fulfill part of their mandate by being, okay, we're going to do a Canadian University campus farm working group or something, nice. you know? Rather than trying to recreate the wheel, um, I just yeah, talk to her. Okay, cool. I, think that's I just wanted idea. to talk about the co-op. I'm just mulling over this co-op thing, and I just want to. Well, I'm kind of struggling with it because I think you know, we're talking about you know campus farms struggling for money and and being sustainable, and it, but I think we always have to remember we're part of. University, we're in a really privileged place, yeah, and so I think for us to be sort of saying, "Oh, we should try to get better deals on things," and I, I almost feel the opposite. Like I feel like we should be le leveraging our institutional budgets and and at, to like buy more seeds from those organic farmers mm -hmm. who are producing organic seed. You know, like we have this opportunity to you know and buy like the food services have the opportunity to buy food from these smaller farms right and so as campus farms we should be trying to like okay s support those smaller organizations and not be trying to like grind them down and get a better deal and not that i know that's yeah. not what you were suggesting but i, I just think i want to be cautious around that sort of thing and also the optics of it we're publicly funded institution and we're trying to like uh, get better deals and as universities, we have amazing procurement teams who already get bulk buying deals with all sorts of stuff and discounts on all sorts of things. So I was thinking one of the things maybe UTSC maybe can think about, or maybe you've already done this work, but over the next year is like, okay, where are all of these um, leverage points within the university, like your procurement policy, your procurement teams, um, what deals can they get you already? Um, the well-being um, units on campus, like I know we haven't really talked about, you were talking about value proposition, but it's like, okay, like student well-being and student health, like all of those types of organizations or units would be really supportive of a farm. So I don't know, just, I don't know if you've done that mapping exercise of like just what's even available in the institution that could support, and thinking outside the box, like not just food services, but thinking about all these other things. So I think that might be sort of a short term, yeah, I mean, or this time next year yeah. or something. I mean, as I said, we're really at the early stage. So even uh, saying that we have a campus farm, most of people on campus are like, what? We have a farm? So I'm like, yes, we do. <laughs> so I think, yeah, that's, I think the first step we need to do is like to really bring more awareness. And that's been kind of, I mean, this project is really kind of hidden and not really put forward yet. So that's where we're moving forward with having co for proposal for faculty lecture to actually be involved for next year. And I've also started to do like a tour so then actually people can come on site and see it because yeah, often they're like, but where is it? And because it's kind of so remotely compared to the rest of the campus, it's like, okay, I didn't even know. So yeah, I think that's, and that was yeah part of the process of, you know, who can be involved if we want to be really inclusive of integrating all the programming and services, that's what we will have to do, yeah, really looking at how everyone can be involved in it, so. Trying to allude to that before as well, that I think that universities should pay because, um, well, especially for rooftop farming, people are asking the question, because there's a lot of green roofs, green roof technology is, is being used, its, its use is becoming more widespread, but rooftop farming is not a common application of the technology. And the reason why is because rooftop farms cost more money. Um, and because we're at a university, we're able to have a rooftop farm. So I feel like universities should be investing in these 
um, innovative applications so that we can try different things and we can experiment and then the industry can take on. So yeah, I think it's, I don't know if anyone's left here from the administration of, <laughs> but I was trying to sort of hint that, you know, as much as there is going to be fundraising happening outside of it, the university should be investing some money into it because urban farms outside of campuses can't access that. So, and those, those organizations are struggling even more, yeah. <laughs> For, for how universities I'm play a role very in mechanistic about these things. For like for like the role that urban farm projects take at universities that support the society, is that what you mean? No. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's for, that's for internal things oh. like where we've been successful, where we people, you guys, have been successful in in turning this into development I think donations those kinds of things and what are the what are the ways it's worked what are the ways it doesn't work things for, we can for learn. us it's been all about relationships with specific people in different departments okay. and the, the way that it worked at Ryerson was kind of a bit backwards because the facilities department actually the custodial manager actually gave us the key to the farm if yeah. that makes sense like champions oh, I guess is what it makes total sense yeah yeah um, so it was, it was how we framed it, but it was also who, you know, it was, it was, sometimes I say that the real champions of the project were the people in the administration and the higher levels who approved. I don't think that we've had a different experience here, Mike. Good for the minutes, too. Don't write that down. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think that what, sorry? No, no, I think we've had a very similar experience here. That, yeah, that, that the administration, I mean, the very have fact to be on that board. you had so many senior administrators and finance people in the room today, yeah. and that we're meeting in council chambers, right? As opposed to some classroom someplace. Okay. Well, What's it? Council chambers is the Zoom, because it's the only room that had room 80 for students. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really interesting, because it's like, you know, the Zoom to work. So See, I was just going for larger yeah. meaning. <laughs> so you find that you do have champions, yeah. and that that's what's gotten you the yeah. success yes. that you've achieved today. Well, nope, no one's written any big checks yet, but. <laughs> But you're not supported. But, yeah, you can write that down, too. Um, <laughs> but we have, like, operations that are very yeah. much behind this. We have, like, academic, like, the dean's office is, is behind this. We're in a unique situation in the sense that we haven't done a lot. Beatrice has done a ton. Most of us haven't, uh, to be honest. Um, but we have an administration and, like, an operation side of things uh, and the admin side that's willing to kind of get behind this. Uh, so what we're, we keep, like, kind of pushing is that for this to kind of move forward, there's two kind of key things. Well, one would be today actually kind of bringing people together. I think it was amazing for the admin and that kind of uh, people in the dean's office to kind of hear what's going on on other campuses and UBC and to actually kind of see what might be viable. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is we have, for whatever reason, not because of the people, Dan and I are on the steering committee, Beatrice is involved in that, uh, among other people, we've had a hard time actually reaching out campus-wide. Um, the, the dean's office hasn't done that work yet, and that's kind of the role of the dean's office to kind of play that, do that outreach. And so they haven't done that yet, partially because we're so nascent and we don't, we may have different visions, uh, plural, uh, but there's not something that we can necessarily rule out to different academic units or different centers. We're not quite there yet, but that's kind of one of the key things that we need to actually do because the, the operations, admin, dean's office are in support, but we don't have something to push out yet. Anyway, so that'd be the second thing is that we need the actual kind of buy-in. Uh, we have no we have no real communications with the student union yet for some reason I'm, I'm not sure again this is just a capacity issue we, Beatrice has some but the, there's some work to be done there for sure at least like from like the the faculty side of things 
Uh, and then the, the last thing to say is that we keep pushing the admin that they have to hire Beatrice on a more permanent basis and more than one Beatrice. And we're all pushing to actually get academic lines in our for a faculty complement for a position in, say, urban ag uh, that would be a split appointment between kind of someone dedicated to the farm and someone that also plays a, uh, does a lot of liaison work with other faculty members in departments. So that's kind of where we're at now. Uh, and we're here to kind of learn more than anything. I think yeah. getting a full-time position for Beatrice is probably the most important. It's going straight. Because <laughs> once you create a job at a university, it's there. You know, and it takes a lot to create a job. Like at Ryerson, we have to fill out a 30-page questionnaire for the job evaluation specialist. And then you have to find someone for them to report to. And But then once all that's done, that's just there. And finding the money is another thing. But that job isn't probably going to be destroyed once it's been created. And then there's one person, at least, to start creating other jobs and build more capacity. So I think that getting that first paid job is important. We have a harvest party every year where we invite all the champions and all the students, like we serve free soup, and we invite everybody across the administration who's played a key role, and we give them an award, and or we make them taste our pie, or we get students to compete and make the best pie, and then we get the champions to Give sample it. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> yeah, exactly right. So, so I think that's that's another way, I guess, a more specific way that we try to create energy and is to get everyone in the room. And I think at Ryerson, everybody thinks the farm is their farm like students, staff, faculty, right up to the president's office, like everybody volunteers, everybody feel re like really, like a, like a lot of the operations staff take their breaks up there because they all have keys to the roof. Some of them even smoke, it's kind of irritating. And, um, but then yeah, just everybody is like, oh, it's the farm, it's our farm. I think it's important to make sure everybody feels like we're, in, well, we're all in this together. Actually, to rebound on that, I want uh, Hofra to go to the rooftop garden <laughs> because at a small scale, that's what I've been doing also to kind of give back that space to the campus. And we've been doing um, uh, an event every week that we call the weekly drop-in lunch. So we actually open the rooftop garden and everyone can come bring their own lunch and just try and taste what's in production. So and I've got so many good experience of people discovering what the service berry is or what the ground cherries are and cucumber melon. That's a big thing of this year, like cucumber melon. So yeah, I mean, unless there is someone who want to add something, I think it would be good to kind of wrap up and uh, then slowly move towards the rooftop. And there is also this panel discussion happening at 3.30, so I don't know if any one of you is willing to attend, but that's kind of on the way to the rooftop. So it's back to the Catalyst Center where we were this morning, so we can just slowly move back there. Uh, so yeah, I was planning to do the tour of the roof of the campus, but I guess that's a reason for another meeting here at UTSC. Let's call it for next year. And, um, and then also following that panel discussion, there is a social event also at the rooftop. So you're all welcome to attend. I have free tickets for you all, so just let me know if you will be coming. And uh, yeah, so anything to add, Jane? Just uh, really happy to have met many of you for the first time. That's wonderful work. Thank you. And thank you, Beatrice, for being there all that time in Montreal. And uh, yeah. And we are, uh, our, I'm sure we are welcome to collaborate in uh, building a network or something. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yes.